All right, let's go ahead and get started tonight. And uh, <clears throat> we'll start off with a time of prayer. And uh, if you have a prayer request, go ahead and make that known and we'll pray for, for a bit. Anybody? Anybody else? Um, I talked to Kim today, and she let me know that she tested positive in Charlene, and Kim's dad, and Maggie all tested positive. Yeah. So we have two guys there. Okay. Ken Green and his wife Denise, they both tested positive, and um, he's supposed to have, I think, a hip surgery on the 24th. Oh yeah, and then Debbie texted and said she won't be here. I guess um, Leroy's oxygen dropped really low after his dialysis today, and he wasn't responsive. But then he is. He's, I guess he's back at home, but his nurse is going to check on him. And his oxygen was at 99, so it's back up. So. I don't know how many, if anyone in here, maybe Chris might remember Hal Stringer and his wife Linda used to come to church here several years ago. They came from Tulsa. They were members. Um, anyway, he passed away. I was going to say Darlene would remember him. Anybody else? <coughs> Who wants to pray tonight? Somebody want to lead out? A volunteer? Okay, let's all pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come, come together, Lord, Lord, to lift up these needs to you. Lord, to, um, Lord, we just thank you that you are in the business of healing. Lord, from the, from and Lord, just Bible, touching lives, um, especially Lord, with so many, the uh, members COVID are, still in. <coughs> Lord, I just pray God. you guide us. And Lord, out you would just bring them through this Lord, also, difficult just, time. Uh, just you know, be with Thank you for all that you do. Um, Show yourself strong in might their be, lives. Uh, suffering a lot, <clears throat> God. Just uh, let them know that you know you're with them. That your presence mm. is all around, and that you know we're all going to be reunited one day. Lord, just continue to bless us and strengthen us, and allow us to encourage each other. Thank you for this. Um, Evening and be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Um, we sort of, sort of ended our study of the um, of God as far as attribute scope, and uh, I was thinking since then last week that. Any good conversation you have with somebody that has a question about God, I think I gave, I, I gave you a lot of information, but that information can be well used in the presentation of the gospel. You know, if a question ever came up, you know, well, well who is God? You know, with the study of the attributes, you know, you can, you can tell. You can tell them. Um, even going back to the time of the Exodus when God showed himself through the burning bush, if you'll recall those uh, <clears throat> examples. But uh, they don't, uh, today, uh, tonight I, I said that we would look, start looking into um, 
the written word, the scripture, um, because when you, when you look at our world today, um, there's really an absence of absolute truth. And so my first question is, what is truth? How would you define truth? Anybody? <clears throat> How would you define truth? You can, you can write in your notes, my definition of truth is, and then, but what would you say? <clears throat> what is truth? I guess to me, truth is something that you know to be right. How many of you agree with that? Okay. It's a good answer. Anybody else? It's almost like a feeling, too. Oh, you're getting pragmatic there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he done stepped into pragmatism. No. <laughs> okay. I see what you're saying, though. Anybody know what pragmatism means? Anybody? It's kind of like a, you set aside absolute truth for what works for the moment, okay? Relative. relative to your situation or what's going on an environment or whatever it's it, it's it's like that's what it is uh, who's it william james it was like the father of pragmatism <clears throat> i wouldn't suggest reading it but unless you get you can't sleep okay <clears throat> um but uh it there's a movement and a lot of it again it is is pragmatic which means again it's just relative there are no absolute truths and there are other idealisms that kind of embrace that same philosophy uh, <clears throat> but overall it's kind of it, it's it's just another just another pot of pragmatism burning on the stove um, <clears throat> i think our world again sees a lot of or we, we see in our world a lot of um, viewpoints, a lot of truth that's, again, relative to society. <clears throat> um, no one likes to consider scriptural truth. That becomes offensive, offensive to you. You, know, you don't wanna hurt nobody's feelings or you don't wanna, you don't wanna judge them or you, know, you don't want to, uh, <clears throat> cast them away you know that that's kind of what it what it's I, I feel good about myself so leave me alone you know I'm, I'm okay I'm you know whatever um, but we've lost this idea that there's fixed truth now truth can be anything to you know I <clears throat> I deal a lot with truth uh, at work because I have to know certain things um, I have to know certain things about the patients, uh, my employees, my budget, <clears throat> and a lot of things, just factual things. But when I put all those things together, the program works fine. And so that's kind of like another example of what truth is. There's a lot of facts, a lot of factual things out there. But when it all comes together, truth becomes like a meal like there's there's a lot of ingredients facts are a lot of ingredients but when those facts come together it, it it forms the meal just like you make fry bread people make fry bread a certain way you know you know <clears throat> i was in walmart one time and i saw a church lady I saw her a church lady at walmart and she didn't know i was there but she got she had a <clears throat> 12 pack of beer she put that beer in her, 
in her, in her basket. And then she turned around, and she saw him, and she just got, oh! she said, and the first, she didn't say hello or nothing. She said, oh, that's for my fry bread recipe. You know? <laughs> I said, I didn't say a word, you know. <clears throat> but uh, again, truth, truth is, is, is available because simple things are truthful. You know, two plus two. What's the truth of that equation? It's four, isn't it? Two plus two equals four. Uh, but there's other there's other mathematical situations where it's 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 not an absolute. It's plus or minus. You know, it could be plus or minus this. You know, um, but again, truth is fleeting in a, in our world today. Um, but truth goes beyond just the the mere facts. When you when you again when you when you embrace scripture, truth goes beyond just facts because the truth is who and what we see in God, his nature, his attributes, uh, everything about him. And the truth of scripture is that God is a redeeming God. We have before us the story of redemption, his message to us what He's done to bring us into a relationship with Him, but also how to walk in that relationship. When you read the, especially the epistles in the New Testament, it tells us a lot about how to walk, how to live. I like in some verses, it says, knowing that the terror of the Lord is nigh, what sort of people should we be? Or it says, ought we to be? You know, what, how, how are we to live? You know? But again, truth is something that God tells us is absolute, according to Scripture. In the book of Genesis, chapter 3, we see the fall of man. And if, you'll, if you want to turn it real quick, let's just look at it real quick. Genesis, chapter 3. <clears throat> One of these days, I'm going to use this as a kind of a sermon illustration, especially when you talk about how does, how does, how does sin come about in our lives? Okay, that's going to be the subject matter. But how does sin come about? You know, <clears throat> do we just, you know, do wrong or what? But if you read there in the third chapter, verse 1, it says the serpent was more subtle. In some versions, it says cunning. Um, I've seen one version says tricky, okay? Uh, but the serpent was more subtle, something that was created by God. But at, in, in some, in a, in a lot of what we know as far as commentaries, something that had been taken over by Satan, okay, by the devil. Uh, but he was very cunning, subtle, uh, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, now here's the question, yea, or has God really said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You see, there's, there's, there's a twisting of truth right at the beginning to question, for, to, for the woman to question truth. Because God gave her that truth. Do not, okay? But now he's trying to subvert the question. He's trying to subvert the truth. Hath God, has God really said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden? And then she replies in verse 2, he says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. In that very little verse, Eve, the woman, <clears throat> Eve, exaggerates because what she says is not what God said okay when you go back and read chapter 2 there's an exaggeration by Eve or the woman because again she says God has said you shall not eat of it neither shall you touch it that's the exaggeration okay lest ye die and the serpent said unto the woman you shall not surely die for God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Again, there's that 
subversion of the truth. Oh, but you'll be like the gods. You'll be able to know, you know. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a pattern <clears throat> when you see lives being tormented or being taken over by a principle of sin, whatever that sin may be. Um, <clears throat> I did this, I did partial, or use this part in a study uh, a few years ago at Falls Creek. And it was about uh, addictions, not so much on a professional level counsel, but just what brings about an addiction, okay? For one, it's a subversion of truth. And again, the, what we see in this passage is a, an effort by the enemy, our enemy, to get us to question whether or not it's good or bad, whether or not it's a good thing, whether or not it's harmful. Well, yeah, you can, you can do this for a little while, but you'll be okay, you know. But again, that, that, that truth, that truth is being twisted and again, it serves as a pattern for the things that we are involved in, whatever that sin may be. Uh, <clears throat> can be a lot of different things. But again, the pattern kind of remains the same. Truth is what we need in our world today. There, I mean, again, there's, there's, there's no boundaries. Truth has been subverted. Truth has, truth has been under attack, especially scriptural truth. Um, if you think about it, <clears throat> um, when you when when you take medicine, you you can only take a certain amount. That's a truth. If you were to take more, what would happen? Most likely, what would happen? You'd get an overdose, right? Or in mathematics, there's truth tied to mathematics that this formula if worked out like the Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem states truth in relation to distances and measurements. And it's true all the time. But yet, in some cases, we subvert truth, again, to make us feel better or, or to carry out a longing or a passion or whatever and saying that it's okay. But there, is those, there are those truths. Because people sometimes they'll say, well, there's no absolute truths. Yes, there is. Then you say, well, is, is that an absolute truth in itself? When they state that, there's no absolute truth. Well, is that an absolute? Or they'll say there's no absolute truth. Then you say, well, is, is, is that an absolute truth? So they kind of get caught in a um, cycle of linguistic error, they say. But truth in itself... As we look at Scripture, I believe God tells us everything we need to know for the redemptive purpose as well as the discipline, the discipline issue or the discipleship issue, how to walk in Christ. It's there. Everything about our daily needs is found in the truth of Scripture. Now, um, let's look at a few of those, look at a few passages real quickly. <clears throat> In Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and we're going, we'll, we'll look into more things. In the, uh, this will be about four part section, four part session on the scriptures. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter four, talking about the word of God. There in verse twelve, Hebrews four twelve says, "For the word of God is quick and powerful." and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God. <clears throat> the best interpretation of Scripture will always be Scripture itself. The Scripture tells us here, the Word of God is quick, now, when you read your translations, that word quick means alive. Sometimes in the other versions, in the, in, in the King James, you hath he quickened. That word quickened means to be brought alive. Okay, that word quickened. So, again, we're, we're working from an, old, an old, older English translation. The Word of God is alive. It's powerful. 
There's something about God's Word. I mean, you can, you can just take the, you can take the Bible, and I've had a, a literature, literature class where we just read part of the Old Testament. That was part of our class. But when we ask for the guidance and the direction from God and the Holy Spirit to show us Himself through His Word, the Word of God becomes alive. I saw a video, and I think I, I, think I mentioned it one time. There were a group of Chinese uh, Christians who, who met together, and somehow, somebody in some way smuggled Bibles into their, into their group. It's probably a hundred people as they met secretly. But they gave them all Bibles. They got those Bibles out, and, and they knew they got them. And they, but, but what was amazing was they, they got those Bibles, and they just, they, it, it's like they, they were hugging them. And they were crying over them because they had an actual copy of God's Word in their hands now. Not just one Bible, but everybody had a copy. And they were just, they were just, they were praising the Lord, crying, and just, just holding on to that new Bible that they had just received. But yet sometimes our Bibles just rest on the coffee table, don't they, all week? Wherever they may be. Truth, again, the Word of God is quick and powerful. But we as Christians, know, and knowing this, sometimes again, we get lazy with it. We get lazy in reading God's Word. We get lazy in just knowing what Scripture says. Um, I have a Bible. Well, I've got two Bible apps on my phone. I try to look at them every day. and It shows me a Bible verse uh, for every day. I read that. And, uh, you know, I, the other day I was just at home by myself and our dog put his paws up me. So I, my, my, my Bible verse for the day came up, just bing, and there it was. And I said, do you want me to read you the Bible? You know, I had nobody else talk to. Everybody was gone. So I read the Bible verse to my dog. And so it was almost like he was looking at the Bible verse. But that's, a, that's just a story. But <clears throat> the, the Scriptures are alive. The scriptures are about your relationship with God. Sometimes when we get away from God or there's things in our life that are taking precedent over our walk with the Lord, sometimes we know we don't want to engage in that word because it is alive. It's life changing. It can take our thoughts and align them back to what God wants for us. It's powerful. It's alive. And it says it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. If you... Soul and spirit are two parts of us. Um, our soul, in, in short, our soul is who, who we see every day. It's how you project yourself. It's... Uh, <clears throat> you're loud and boisterous, that's, that's a part of who you are. It's that, that's the soul part of you. Your will, your emotions, your intellect, all those things make up your soul. Your spirit, however, is where, as a Christian, is where God lives. The soul or the spirit itself, again, prior to conversion, is dead. There's no, there's no communion with God there. But yet, when we are quickened or we are made alive, that spirit within us is alive. It's reborn. And it's through that avenue that God connects with us. He doesn't connect with us through the flesh. Okay, 1 Corinthians, you read 1 Corinthians, it talks about the fleshly things, carnality, um, things doing things because of the flesh. Because it feels good, smells good, tastes good, whatever. Gives you pleasure. That's fleshly things. But He communicates with us through His Spirit. Godly, godliness, holiness, peace, love, joy, all those, all those things. But He says it's a two-edged sword. And that sword, the Word of God, pierces those things. It separates, it opens up the heart, much like a, uh, an animal, I won't say cadaver, but an animal carcass, you know. It's laid open. You can see everything. That's kind of what the Word of God does. It opens up our heart. 
It opens up to see our intent. It opens us up to see our motives. It opens up to see those things if we are in sinful nature. But yet he can also use that word to see where we're faithful, true, caring, loving, humble, meek. He sees those things as well. And it says also, it says, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And again, that's where the openness comes about. Um, verse 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I mean, it's no secret. God knows what goes through our minds. God knows through what goes through our thoughts. He knows what we engage in. He knows what we're doing. You know, and you know, are are, are we bringing joy? Are we bringing honor to the Lord through our lives? Now, the last section on this one, <clears throat> if you look at Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter two. Now it's getting warm in here. I'm starting to sweat. <clears throat> Okay. Second Timothy chapter two. If you look there at verse verse fourteen. Second Timothy two fourteen. It says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. Notice that. Here's an element. <laughs> but listen to what he says again. He says, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them that charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. Again, I think, I think there's a look back in Scripture or just the, the hint of pragmatism um, or you know, the, the things that we see in our, in, even in today's world. Um, it says, but to the, sub, to the subverting of the hearers. In other words, lying to people, uh, twisting the truth. Um, and then, but look at verse 15, it says, but study to show thyself approved unto God. Um, study. You know, a lot of times people ask me, how do you get to know God better? Study. Read. You know, get involved with Him. Um, I know it's kind of messy in our house, but <clears throat> I have a corner by our sofa, and I got all my books there. I got books about uh, doctrine. <laughs> I've got books about anything, scripture, commentaries. Um, and, and again, I, I probably don't keep it the neatest, and Kirsten knows that. I, I, it's kind of messy, but I, I, I have those books that I pick up as I, as I sit there on the edge of that couch. I, I'll grab a book and read through it. I was reading one uh, this morning, or not this morning, but uh, late this afternoon, uh, about the text and the authority of the scriptures, and um, you know, just reading things. The way we understand who God is is knowing what does He say about Himself, and what does He say about our relationship. What does He say about that? There's much to it, much to the revelation that we have from God. Because again, His Word is truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. And when you think about truth, truth is like a, a wielded sword. It's a sword that's defensive, but yet offensive. You know, there's a, there's been a lot of um, people out there that purport truth, 
And one of the things they always say is that you can't judge me. You know, but some people, I've heard some people say, well, the Bible says you can't judge. That's not true. Read scripture. The Bible says that we can judge. Calls us, you know, you, you, you shall know them by their fruit. I mean, you know, you shouldn't go probably put it on Facebook or anything or you know, stuff like that. But um, I think we have a responsibility to defend truth against error. You know, I, I used to work with this lady. And she would always say stuff. She said, well, the Bible, I think the Bible says this and the Bible says that. And, uh, you know. To a, to a degree, you finally get enough. You know. And I said, well, I said, where did you hear that from? That's my first question. I said, where did you hear that from? I said, because that's not in the Bible. She said, oh. Then she would get offended because I'd say, well, the Bible does say this. And it goes against what she thought. So she'd get mad and zip up, wouldn't talk to me for a while. But she was always raising objections. She said, I've read the Bible. I've read it back and forth. And I said, well, how many times? And I would just, you know, just mess with her. But she would say things that weren't scriptural. Or she would say something, it was out of context with what she was trying to claim. And so I, you know. <clears throat> but I was thankful for our secretary at the time because she knew I was a pastor. Well, the other lady did too, but she said, well, let's ask, Rand, let's ask Brother Randy. So I'd come out of my office and they'd ask me a question. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know everything. I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know every single theological truth out there, but I'm learning. What does Mark Twain say? It's not the things of the unknown that bother me. It's the things I do know that bother me, something of that nature. Um, uh, Sometimes we have a difficult enough time just processing what we do know, how to walk faithfully, how to trust God. Because again, <clears throat> you know, like on Sunday, Sunday morning service, you know, a lot of Christians still have a lot of problems and issues with stuff, Indian stuff. I mean, I'm not saying don't be Indian, but, you know, there, there's, there's a time and a place where we have to weigh things against the gospel. We have to weigh things against what God's truth says. You know, we had, I had a good conversation with Mark Custolo at Falls Creek. We, we, we spent some time talking afterwards in different times. And, and uh, you know, and he's seen, he's seen it all on the reservations and everything. You know, there, there are things that are good, but there are, there are those things that we need to weigh against the truth of Scripture. And... Uh, but again, scriptural truth, it says, again, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, <clears throat> I take great care in trying to make sure that I don't speak of error. Now, my words might get mumbled sometimes or my voice or whatever or... You know, and I've heard preachers say inadvertent things. You know, we were talking about that the other, was it last night, I think? Uh, we was talking about Victor Cope. And uh, it's well known, according to the record of other preachers and pastors, that on Victor Cope's first sermon ever, he was preaching um, on a sermon about Samson. I hope this don't hit the airways. No. <clears throat> but according to these pastors, in his sermon about Samson, he started calling Samson Tarzan. <laughs> Somewhere down the line in, that, in his study. And that, that comes from other preachers, you know. I, I wasn't there, I didn't see it. But, uh, you know, there are those sometimes inadvertent things we may say, and it may be error, but I purposely try to, to, to pray, of course, in presentation. Prayer in preaching the gospel. Um, because sometimes, you know, like at Falls Creek, you know, we're up there in the front. And 
I, I often have verses already marked because I don't want to get confused. I don't want to, I don't want to keep somebody up there longer than, and then losing their attention because, man, there's a, there's a bass drum right there that's boom, boom, and I can't hardly hear them. They can't hardly hear me. So I, I give them enough information if they, you know, to make that commitment or whatever, then send them to the prayer room or the decision room to find, you know, follow up because sometimes you can't hear. <clears throat> and so, uh, but I try to be ready for stuff. You know, I, I, I rehearse. If somebody's come up there and they're thinking about suicide, I, ha I have a plan. Um, you know, it's that uh, <clears throat> just, just basic questions, you know, QPR stuff. I use QPR if, if somebody comes with an issue about suicide or taking their own life or self-harm. Um, because you, you know, it's, it's got to be quick. You, know, you can't sit there and think, oh man, let me look that up. You know, uh, you have to be ready on the spot. Um, but other, other verses about prayer, how do you, how do you refocus? First John 1, 9, you know, that's just programmed in. Um, the Roman road, you got to have that ready, you know, all these things. But again, truth gets us to a place where as we live life, it's a peaceable life. It's a life that's transforming. And even though we may go through a rough spell, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially, we're able to navigate those difficult times when we rely on truth. Uh, a good example was and I don't, I don't think she minds me saying this about Miranda. Uh, they didn't play too well last night. But coach had them running a lot. A lot of leg work today. And uh, the girls, as they came out of the field, they come, they, they come through a long walkway, and then there's open the big fence. And I was watching them come through, and man, their faces were just, they were drained. They were tired. Some had dirt all over their pants. It looked like they'd been on their knees. And, and uh, they were just exhausted. And I saw Miranda come in. Well, she's just hopping along, you know. And I thought, maybe she didn't have to do that. But I said, what did y'all do? She said, leg work. A lot of running, leg stuff. And I said, it didn't bother you, did it? She said, well, at first it did. But she said... I was okay after that. It's because, you know, you look at her, she's in shape. I mean, she's in pretty good shape physically. She's able to do all that stuff. But the other girls, you know, they're kind of heavy. They're kind of on the big side and they struggle with those cardiac, cardiovascular exercise and they were worn out. In the same way with scripture, when you think about our spiritual lives, we may struggle but yet, with, with the truth of Scripture applied to our life to continue to move forward and know that perhaps these things happen because that's where God wants me. It's what sustains us in the long walk. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Again, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that says it's truth. You know, it's everywhere. You know, Congress, it's, at, it's, it's, it's in our nation's capital. It's in our legislatures. You know, there's, some say this, got to do this, got to be this. But it says in, in verse 16, it says, but, profane, or, but shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the re resurrection is already past, and overthrow the faith of some. You see, there's always a danger, even in religious circles, even in uh, evangelical circles, that there's an error of truth out there. Don't believe everything you see on TV, in other words. Not everybody's theologically sound as they need to be. Um, 
you know. But every, you know, there's there are certain parts of our direct TV that have a lot of different religious programming. You know, be wary of it. You know, you've got a Bible. Read it. Again, if you have a question, you can text. Text Jennifer. Text me. I might not get right back to you, but I'll find out. Is so and so on the up and up? <clears throat> yeah. They said this. What about you know? Is that truthful? Because I've had a lot of people say that. Um, but again, truth is something that we need to embrace as Christians. It says, but they have erred. But it says this in verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that the name of the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And then it talks about this, this great house fleeing these things in verse 20, verse 20 through, 22 and 23. And it says in verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. See, there's that word again, truth. God has given us a standard. And that standard has become our hope. It's become our expectation. It's that truth that guides us. It's a truth that helps us to, to know what's authentic and what's unreal. You know, I've talked about the dollar bill. The, uh, you know, the, what is it? <clears throat> uh, the fake dollar bill. Um, it's not real. And you know, there's, that, there's, that, there's an old illustration about an FBI. They say they, what they do is to, to, to know what's counterfeit and what's not. They focus on the real thing. They know every part of a, a real, authentic $20 bill or a $100 bill. They know every part of it. They know the threads. They know the numbers, how things are formed on those, on those bills. They know everything the, of, of the authentic bill. And when they know everything about that authentic bill, they know automatically can tell the counterfeit. That's kind of the same principle that's applied to Scripture. When we know what God's Word says, we automatically we should know what the counterfeit is out there should raise a red light. <clears throat> there was, when we were at Belvin, I was pastoring at Belvin one time, and uh, we were meeting in the back in the fellowship hall, and there was a guy who came in, and a uh, black gentleman came in, and he had a guitar. And he set off to my, you know, I was sitting there at the table, and he was sitting off to the side, and I was teaching class. I was teaching Bible study class. And, um, you know, he, he sat there, and, you know, but after I was done, he started strumming that guitar, and he was singing a uh, praise hymn. But, man, there was a red light just came on in my heart. Everybody, some, some other folks, oh, yeah, that's just beautiful. But, but man, I had, I had something inside me, a, a, like a discerning spirit. Man, my, my light was like, red light was flashing. I didn't know who he was, but I just felt, I knew something wasn't right. But he said, yeah, brother, if I want to come to your church and I want to minister in the name of Jesus and I want to do this and I want to do that. And, you know, no pay, you know, no, you don't owe me nothing. And, and I said, well, I said, we'll, I said, we'll certainly keep you in mind. Well, when do you want me to come? I said, well, I said, again, I said, we'll, we'll keep you in mind, you know. And I left it at that. Well, <clears throat> that night, one of our ladies called and she said, I'm glad you told that guy that. She said, because he's got very suspect practices and things he does. And she told me of an instance, what happened to her, and he was the guy that did it. And she said, he's got other, he's got other motives on his mind than just playing a guitar in church. And I said, well, I'm glad because I said I had that feeling when I was talking to him. I said I had a discerning spirit that I knew something wasn't right. And she said, you were right. And so, <clears throat> you know, 
but it, it wasn't good. It wasn't good, especially to, to women. It wasn't a good thing for him to be there. So, <clears throat> again, those things serve as a way to help us to understand truth. The counterfeit against the authentic. Knowing that truth. Now, let's look in the book of Psalms, or, uh, yeah, Psalms real quick. Psalms 119. Next week, I'm going to bring a bunch of Bible facts. I'm just going to hand them out. It'll be a handout <clears throat> about different things about the Bible. This is a, well, the longest chapter in the Bible. It's divided up into, if you, if you don't know, uh, it's divided up in, by the Hebrew alphabet. All these, there's, there's sections. There's eight, there's eight verses per section in this one, in this one chapter. And again, they're, they're connected or their, their, their main topic is, it goes by the Hebrew alphabet. So uh, <clears throat> if you look there, the last one on right above 169 says Tau, Tau, last Hebrew alphabet. And the first one, is Aleph, Aleph. But when you read this past or read, when you read this chapter, this is your homework for next week. I mean, you may have a Bible, uh, a weekly, daily Bible reading guide or whatever you may have. Go ahead and do that if you still if you have one. But if not, I want you to focus on the on these passages here. Uh, I would do two a day, maybe three a day, if you can. But again, I want you, I want you to, I want you to usher yourself to do this, okay? And say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to make the pledge to do it. Okay? You don't have to sign anything, or you know, if you don't, you don't have to pay a dollar or anything. But look at these passages. Again, there are eight verses per per section. Verse one to eight is one section. Verse 9 uh, to 16 is another, again, by eights. So do two or three each day. This is your homework. But in these passages are elements of what the Word of God is and what it can do in your life. Okay? Let's look at the first one, chapter one or, ver or chapter nine, 119, verse 1. It says, Blessed are the, the undefiled. Okay? What does that word undefiled mean? And I'm just kind of giving you a way to study. Look at words. What does the word undefiled mean? Uncorrupted. Okay. Uh, others that y'all share. I can't, I can't hardly hear you now. But uh, unspoiled. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. They're undefiled for a reason. And what's that reason? They walk in the law of the Lord. Okay. Look at the second verse. Blessed are they that keep His testimonies. Blessed are you. When we keep what He says, we keep what He's instructing us to do daily. It says they're blessed. And it says, and that seek Him with the whole heart. The whole heart. I've been guilty of this in the past where um, I, I, I would study, but it'd be at the last minute. My aunt used to, when I was in junior high, high school, at church, uh, just to get us to read the Bible. If we, if we had to be honest about it, though. To get us to read the Bible, <clears throat> if we did it for the whole week, we got to go to Tasty Freeze. And, and we never got, you know, Tasty Freeze was a luxury, you know, because we didn't get cheeseburgers. We, we didn't have a McDonald's or anything there. But she challenges, you read the Bible, I'll take you to get you a jumbo cheeseburger. 
And there were times I would forget, but I would make up for it Saturday because I wanted that cheeseburger. I was more interested in the food, the food prize. Or, um, but I read the Bible, you know. Or we would read scripture. We'd have to memorize scripture. We'd get those little bitty Bibles. A man would give us Bibles for memorizing scripture. We'd get in front of the church and do that. <clears throat> And sometimes I'd be trying to cram to try and get a verse in. But I also was like that in my adult life too. There were times I would neglect what I should be doing. And I'll be honest with you. There were times that when I was at, when I was at Belvin, I felt ashamed because I felt like I hadn't studied enough. That I hadn't researched enough and I'd be praying before I got up God forgive me because I don't feel prepared enough for this but even when I felt unprepared at that moment it's like God would fill my heart and I said God teach me better ways to discipline myself to study because even in my, what I felt like was feeling weak, weak at that moment, God supplied. And there were times I felt, I felt like I didn't preach a good message at all, but people were saying, oh, that was so good. That was so, I felt, I felt I didn't do it justice. Um, I try to preach without notes. I don't know if you've noticed that. I try to preach without notes. I, I have maybe a few words here and there, but not, I don't have an outline. I don't have, I don't have my illustrations in, in, in my notes or anything. But I try to memorize. I try to study ahead of time. I do rely on them sometimes. So I am getting older. But with the truth of Scripture, these things, it ought to, it ought to, it ought to just lead us to seek Him with our whole heart. Verse 3 says, they also do no iniquity. Talking about the blessed ones. It says, because they walk in His ways. So your assignment for next Wednesday is to work through this chapter, chapter 119, and just glean from it. Look at words like that word that we looked at in the very first. What does it mean? You write out undefiled. What does that mean? Other words, um, statutes, those synonyms for Scripture. You see, you see the, law, the law of the Lord, um, testimonies, verse 2, uh, His ways, verse 3, uh, His precepts in verse 4, um, statutes again in verse 5, commandments in verse 6, uh, righteous judgments in 7, Again, statutes in verse 8. So look at those synonyms. Okay. And what, what's, what's common about knowing the Scriptures? Again, they're undefiled in the way. They're blessed. They seek Him with their whole heart. They walk in His ways. They keep, they keep their precepts diligently. Um, that my ways are directed uh, shall not be ashamed. I will praise thee and I will keep thy statutes. And it says, Oh, forsake me not utterly. So again, this is your assignment for next, Saturday, or next Wednesday. Work through the chapter. Look at synonyms, definitions, and we'll, we'll kind of go over these, a few of them, next Wednesday. But we'll have other issues uh, or study some other things according to Scripture. Uh, and, and I, I want, I'm going to focus next week on verse uh, 106 uh, a little bit more because again, it's it's a to me it's the it's probably the most important verse in the whole chapter because it says there it says I, oh Psalm 119 <clears throat> verse 105. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I've known that scripture seemed like forever. But look at what it says. Thy word 
is a lamp unto my feet. That's where I stand. That's my foundation. But not only is it my foundation, where I stand, what does it say? It's also a light unto my path, wherever I go. It shines a light in front of me. You know, again, we, you know, we, we have to take our dog out at night, <clears throat> sometimes kind of late. But there's a pond right next to our house, and then, you know, it's, I see snakes out there every once in a while. So at night, I take a flashlight because I want to know where I'm going. I want to know where I'm stepping. I want to know where the danger is in case, you know. In the same way, that's what the scripture, we, 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 we have to know what our foundation is concerning the truth. We also need to know where we're walking. We can tell where the danger is, the counterfeit, the lies, the deceiving, the deception. We can see those things as his light shines our path. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the day you give us. Thank you for your love for us. We thank you for truth. And Father, as we continue to look at the, Lord, the, just the nature and the purpose of your word, draw us to a greater conviction of study, memory, speaking your word. Lord, to take it to heart, but not just to take it to heart, but to walk in it daily. Thank you again for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.